No, nope. it's fine. You sound perfect. Okay. Uh, Good. Hello and welcome to Gama Sutra's Wednesday afternoon stream. My name is uh, Alex Warro. I'm an editor with Gama Sutra, and today we're joined by a upcoming GDC speaker and one of my fellow compatriots. Uh, why don't you guys say hello to the folks? Let's start with Jason. Hello, I'm Jason Delaraca, co-founder of Execution Labs. I guess I'm a fellow Canadian. Cool. Mm. And I'm Brian Francis. I'm a contributing editor to Gama Sutra, and you all can see me for once. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Brian has traveled across the country to be in uh, UBM San Francisco offices where he's kind enough to join us. Uh, I think on the screen right now, we have uh, a pre release demo of a game that Jason, your company, has invested in. Uh, and it's called right. Deluvian. And uh, we'll just be running it in the background while we discuss your talk at GC2017, which is going to be kicking off next month. Um, cool. Your talk, if I remember right, it's about, uh, well, like the, the tagline, if I read it right, was how to avoid total studio disaster, right? Correct, yeah. It's, and the, the main title is Advanced Entrepreneurship. So why don't we dig into exactly what you're hoping to accomplish with that? I think, first of all, I, I would love to know what drove you to pitch that kind of talk to GDC this year. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's it's a bit of a result of some of the stuff we've been doing with our own teams that we invest in, right? I mean, obviously, if we're going to invest in a studio, we want them to avoid complete studio disaster. Uh, and obviously, if we're investing in studios because we believe there's a great opportunity and they're going to succeed and kick ass and all that good stuff. And so a lot of the stuff that we do as investors is to coach them, mentor them, give them guidance. Uh, and so, so the talk at GDC is really uh, sort of an amalgamation of many of those learnings and and tips that we've given to our own teams. Uh, and the reality is, I mean, we just see a lot of studios making a lot of the same mistakes o over and over again. So that that's kind of where the the, the so the genesis of that that uh, presentation came from. So, um, oh, go ahead, oh, go for it. No, go for it, Alex. Oh, I just, I mean, like the, the obvious question is. Uh, what are those sort of common mistakes? And like, like if you had to give uh, sort of some like general advice without trying to dig too deeply into the meat of the talk, <laughs> uh, to folks who are watching, like, like what have you seen in your time uh, working in games that you think you could easily avoid if they knew about it? Yeah, I mean, well, so obviously this is sort of the, the, the core of the talk and the idea is that, um, you know, I'll be giving specific case, case studies or examples uh, as opposed to more more theoretical uh, discussion of you know quote unquote doing good business. Um, I, mean, I mean certainly from a indie or independent studio point of view, uh, it's really an identity issue, right? Understanding that okay, we've got a studio, you know, we have bills to pay, people to pay, we have a product that's going to the market. Like, you know, we're not just artists or creators; we're we're business people. We're you know we you know, not literally have to wear a suit, but figuratively you're wearing a suit, you're taking on that role uh, or that identity as, as an entrepreneur. Um, and, and a lot of developers don't do that. Like, e like just even as a mental step, it's just I'm a game maker and I'm making cool stuff with my friends and hopefully we'll make some money maybe. And, you know, they just sort of s stumble uh, along and they never realize, like, hold on a second, I'm an entrepreneur and I need to behave like an entrepreneur in addition to being a game maker. And 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 that's in many ways the first sort of step or, or the first mistake that a lot of developers make. Yeah, I think it's kind of a, um, this is something I've thought about a lot, you know, trying, trying to move through a creative space that still has a strong business component, but one where the business component gets sort of hand, it has like a dirty hand to it, like you sort of want to, you want to, as a creative person, you want to find someone and say, "Hey, handle this for me, so I never have to worry about it." But when you don't have a lot of a lot of money, and even when you have what might look to someone else to be of a lot of money, but it's really not, you really have to take on that role yourself, don't you? And yet people don't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unavoidable, right? I mean, whether you are a starving artist in your basement or you're, you know, a successful 10, 15, 20 person studio, I mean, you always have to take that mindset. The only time you don't have to take that mindset is, well, two, two times. One is if you want to remain a starving artist and like that's your dream in life is to suffer for your craft and, you know, like so intentionally you're avoiding any sort of business or revenue opportunities or you have the sort of proverbial rich uncle that's saying, hey, Brian, here's all the money you need. Just go off and be creative and express yourself and, you know, create for, for creation's sake. Um, 
and, and, and you know, most of us don't have that luxury. Uh, I mean, in some cases as a student, you know, where you don't have a boss or a manager or a company to, bills to worry about, you can kind of have a bit of that freedom uh, and sort of be more experimental. Um, but, but in general, most of us don't have that, that luxury. So, so yeah, it's, uh, you always have to be thinking of the business side of things. You just made me feel a little sad because just you saying like, hey, I'm your uncle, I'm Bryant, I'm going to give you all this money. Like I, I for a half second, <laughs> thought it was to be true, but no, it wasn't. Um, uh, just, just for some context, um, just for a little case study of how the Execution Labs has helped game companies uh, get, get started in this kind of work, could you tell us about the team behind um, Diluvian? I might have said it wrong. Diluvian. Um, yeah. Diluvian. Could you tell us about these folks, um, how you sort of got started with them? and how you help them out a little bit from funding to operations? Sure, so Deluvian is created by a studio called Arachnid Games. Mm -hmm. uh, they're actually a team not, not too far, uh, just over the bridge in, uh, in Oakland, so they're, they're sitting pretty, pretty close to you, Brian. Um, we discovered that team, I think it was not this past E3, but the E3 before, uh, where my partner, co-founder Keith Katz, was at um, uh, the Indie Mix, one of the showcase events uh, that's done uh, sort of in, in the periphery of E3, uh, and he was just blown away by by the visuals, by the vision, by the whole notion of kind of this Jules Verne mixes with a post-apocalyptic type universe, uh, and uh, and so we kind of fell in love with the team, with with the project. Uh, and we suggested that it be in their best interest to allow us to give them some funding uh, and work with them and, and coach them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, when Execution Labs works with a team, there's really three parts to that. One is the, you know, the cold hard cash, right? We, we provide funding uh, and most developers are, are, you know, in need of, of additional funding. Uh, we provide coaching and mentorship. Uh, so we'll work with the team it depends where their needs are, where, where they have gaps, but in terms of the, the project, the game itself, scoping, budgeting, you know, uh, making sure the timeline is, is correct, uh, challenging them on gameplay mechanics, uh, forcing them to do, uh, you know, UX reviews and uh, to do play, play tests and bring actual gamers in to play the game and tell them, you know, they don't understand what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And so we kind of, you know, quote unquote, force them to do these things that are often or easily ignored or forgotten in the sort of pressure uh, of shipping an indie project. Um, and we play the game ourselves and give feedback and so on and so on. So that's called the, the product kind of coaching, mentoring side of things. Um, and then we also help in terms of uh, kind of a broader access or connections uh, in, in the industry. Uh, yeah. So because we've been around so long and, you know, we know so many key or important people at, you know, whatever, whether it's at Microsoft or Xbox or Steam or Twitch or, you know, publishers, uh, we're able to speed up the process by which they can make those connections uh, and they can sort of garner the benefits of having those relationships to sort of speed that up for them because, you know, we open the door and, and sort of shove them in uh, as opposed to, you know, any random indie just showing up you know, it's somewhere like GDC or another show and trying to chase down the, those partners. And so, for example, uh, Deluvian's being published by Gambitious, uh, and that was an introduction that was originally made by us. Now, yeah. of course, the boys at uh, Arachnid, you know, they have to, you know, wow the Gambitious guys. They have to have an amazing product. They have to, you know, share their vision. And, and ultimately, Gambitious is doing the deal and backing Arachnid for that game. But you know, it certainly helps when we can open that door and, and make that an introduction. So, I mean, that's super kind of quick, uh, a sense of the kind of stuff that we do with uh, with teams. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I have a follow-up question real quick. Sure. In the middle of there, you talked about um, um, one of the key goals, something that you and I'm sure Gambitious both do as you're the funder and they're the publisher, um, is, is you're, you're kind of going down to the developer team and you're talking, and you both pr along with providing people, like encouraging them to do to UX testing and making sure they're getting feedback in that regard. Um, you yourself, as one of the money guys, um, is, is you give them feedback saying, I think as a game designer, you should be doing this. How do you feel, I mean, there are a lot of developers who will express frustration when people they feel aren't directly involved in the work of development and who don't know like how hard it was to even get a certain point. Like they bring the product to them and they say, and someone who, who wasn't there through the worst trials gives them some feedback that could absolutely be totally right, 
but but there might be some kind of resentment just because it comes from what they perceive as not the developer side. How do you yeah. how do you sort of deal with that as as in in your mm. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question. I think that's some of the friction you would normally see in the publisher developer relationship, right? Where yeah. the the publisher says blue is popular today, so change that color from red to blue and the developers like, but I spent so much time figuring out that I wanted to um, you know, so that that potential is there. I mean, ultimately you know we're not forcing anyone to change anything mm -hmm. uh and and rather it's um i would say challenging right we're challenging people on their decisions uh we're forcing them to sort of think more rigorously uh we try to ensure that they're looking at sort of the marketplace in general uh and seeing what's going on so you know like they do a competitive analysis to understand who their competition is uh, etc. And, and a lot of it is uh, based on the rigor of proper user research and and, uh, and, and play testing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I'm the first to admit that I'm not a designer, and like no one on our team is a is a designer. But we'll say, you know, go te test it and have real players tell you like they don't understand this mechanic or they can't get past this point or the, the difficulty curve is too great. And so then really it's about pointing to the data and saying, how do you address this, right? If, you know, if 90% of your players can't get past the tutorial, you can't tell me that the game's too easy. Like you have to adjust your learning curve or, or tweak something. So we, we try to make it much more empirical in that sense rather than saying hey man I, I i like blue instead of red so change it because i gave you money and you do what i say um, so that we, we always make it clear that ultimately it's their decision but you know we will challenge them in, in that sense and sort of force them to think okay well why did i make it that way and you know what's the data telling me and and so on and so on yeah real quick i just want to remind people who are watching that if you want to if you want feel free to ask jason questions in the chat and we'll be pulling some from the audience. If you want to ask a question about you're getting your game funded or running your, running a company, um, we're happy to pass them on to Jason for you. Alex, you I said you had a question? Yeah, yeah. hand in the air. Uh, so I'm just curious to know, Jason, how did you get involved with this business in the first place? How did you come to be running Execution Labs and being this kind of business person? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm an old man, right? I, I've been around for, I like, guess, my 21st uh, year in, in the game industry. Um, and... Uh, I, I ran the the, game, uh, the 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 IGDA, the International Game Developer Association, uh, for many many years, uh, and I think you know a lot of people kind of know me from from those days. Uh, I I left in two thousand and nine, and I was doing consulting after that, very sort of business oriented consulting, um, and this kind of weird area of working with governments. Uh, to give them advice on how to better support the game communities and game businesses in their countries. I know this may sound foreign to a, uh, you know, to uh, to Americans, where it's you know sort of you know pure capitalistic. But you know, ma many other countries will sort of look at the re you know, the the businesses in their region and think about where can we intervene, where can we help provide a helping hand, what kind of resources can we provide. Um, and so these governments, you know, don't fully or really understand how games work. And so they, you know, would call me up as the former head of the industry association and say, hey, we need some advice on how we can be useful and productive to, to grow our, our games industry. And so a big part of that consulting tended to revolve around early stage funding, seed financing, um, you know, supporting startups and the, the creation of indie studios. Um, and that is somewhat in contrast to the instinct of most governments, which is let's go get Ubisoft or EA to set up shop in our town or our country, and then boom, we'll have a game industry all of a sudden. Um, and and those companies play an important role, uh, but you can't like you can't just invite them to the middle of the desert, right? You have to have an ecosystem, you have to have talent, you have to have the schools, you have to have success. Even at sort of a small level, for someone at EA or Ubisoft or wherever, say, wow, look what's going on in country X or city Y. We need to be there. And then you can engage the sort of the big companies in that kind of conversation. But many of the regions I would talk to, you know, there was nothing and they were starting from scratch. And so, you know, I really imposed upon them the idea of needing to do incubation, early stage funding, focus on the startups, the indies, original IP, all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was consulting, right? I was advising these people. I never had to do it myself. 
Uh, and then I sat down at one point with some investors in Montreal who were having similar ideas and thought there was an opportunity to do something like that here in Canada. Uh, and it was actually them who kind of pitched to me saying, hey, you know, we hear you've been talking about this stuff. You know, we think you should actually do that here. And if you do, like, we're interested to provide some of the funding to make that happen. Um, and then I'm like, you know, it's like the cloud sort of parted. And it's like, geez, I've been so busy elsewhere, um, you know, advising folks that I never thought of the opportunity to do that here. Um, and so that kind of got the ball rolling. We got other investors on board. Um, Execution Labs is privately funded, meaning, it, you know, we're not, it's not a governmental program or something. It's, it's funding from uh, institutional investors and large corporations that, that fund Execution Labs. So that was about four, four and a half years ago, I think. Um, but it, but that that was kind of the impetus uh, and and a bit the sort of the you know the, the trajectory of, of how how it came about. There's a question for you in chat that we want to pull in a second. But I actually have a personal question. How do you feel about the state of uh, like government funding for games around the world? See, this is something we occasionally report on Gamma Sutra, and I feel like places like the UK and Canada are very strong compared to like say the US where um, we occasionally see things I feel like there was something in Georgia uh, the state of Georgia was doing yeah. some funding stuff other than that it seems pretty paltry like, how do you feel about the state of that uh, globally and like how has it changed in the last couple of years yeah I mean there, there's uh, well I mean we can do like a, a whole other chat just just on that I get so nerdy about it um, I, I mean it's wonderful that you have governments that see the value uh, of games as a as an economy, right? The business of games as being a positive thing, uh, and then also uh, you know games as a valid form of art and entertainment. Um, some countries take p sort of much more of a business perspective. Other countries take much more of an arts perspective. So, for example, I'm going to Zurich uh, next week for the Ludicious uh, Festival, and they they have government funding, but it comes from the Arts Council. So all the government support in Switzerland is specifically for games as an art form, which is different than, for example, in Canada, where the majority of the financial support comes sort of for games as a business, uh, you know, so it's tax breaks and, and things of that nature. Um, the, the other little piece of that is much of the financial programs tend to be post-spend, right? So everyone talks about tax breaks, I and mean, even the UK, the new tax breaks they have is... You, you know, Alex, you have to have your company, you have to go get your funding, you have to spend a million dollars or a hundred thousand, whatever the amount is. Right. And then a year after, when it's all spent, then you file your tax returns and you claim, you know, a rebate based on whatever tax break is available. And then, you know, 18 months from now, you get a nice check for, you know, X percent back, you know, which is wonderful. It's generous, but it presumes that you have the money now to spend to even claim it in the future. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, it's useful if you're set up in that way and can leverage it, but it's not like when you cross the border into Canada, there's a guy there saying, are you a game developer? <laughs> yes, here's a bag of money. I mean, it's not as... <laughs> well, oh, game developer, here you go. Here's your bag of money. If, if it does um, happen to you, anyone in chat, uh, we advise not taking it as the border authorities <laughs> may be after you very shortly. And so, and so a lot of the programs around the world, you know, it, they tend to be, from the government side, kind of less risky, meaning it's post-spend opportunities like tax breaks and so on. Again, wonderful, but it, but it's not like, hey, I need some money. Let me go knock on the government's door and I'll get that bag of money that I need right now. Um, so so they're not always sort of as tuned to the perspective of the game developers who are often desperate for cash right now. So that's like um, sort of quick two cents on that. Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and read um, the question from the chat we wanted to bring in. Um, Toka Gaming, who's based in Poland. Um, uh, kind of wants to know if you have any tips on finding local communities of game developers. Um, this person is finishing up law school and wants to uh, help out small game devs with legal consultant stuff, um, okay. but is having trouble finding a local community. Um, and sadly, says he he can't they can't make it to the capital. Um, so, any tips on sure. just making connections like what, that? What what city did he say he was from? 
they actually didn't specify which city, but if Toka Gaming, if you want to say what city, um, Jason may have an answer, for, a more specific sure. answer for you. Well, I mean, so so Poland has a pretty vibrant game community. I was there, I think, two years ago mm-hmm. at a conference called Digital Dragons, uh, and that's hosted every, I, I want to say, spring uh, time frame. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously with, uh, CD project and the success of the Witcher and Techland and a few others, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of action there. So, uh, you know, digital dragons, which I think is in, uh, Krakow. Um, so we'll, we don't know where this Toka guy is, but, um, you know, that's an annual conference that would be well worth, uh, the time for them to attend, to connect with, uh, the local community. Um, and also recently there have been announcements from the Polish government, um, and I don't know if that's more of a sort of state thing or, or national thing about funding research and development uh, within the country. So, I mean, I think, I think you know, if, if he were to go to the Gamma Sutra site and just punch in Poland into the, into the search bar, he'd get a few articles about action going on in, in Poland and then to mm-hmm. look, up, look up the Digital Dragons uh, folks. And that would probably be a good sort of rabbit hole to dive into the community over there. We do. We do have the city. Uh, uh, they're located in the um, on the coast uh, in the Tri City, which encompasses. And I'm going to get these names wrong. I apologize. Gdansk, Gdynia, uh, Gdynia, <laughs> and Sopot. I'm sorry. I, I am yeah. not Polish. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, my my Polish geography is not strong enough. Uh, I mean, he he may need to get in a car or train and visit Krakow and Roklaw and. And, if, and Warsaw and a few of the other places that actually have uh, or serve as hubs for, for the game industry. But yeah, um, yeah, it, sh- it shouldn't be too hard. I think I think starting with Digital Dragons is probably a good well, rabbit hole. Follow, follow up for Toka, just, just kind of um, once once they've managed to track down one of these fine fo- fine game devs, um, um, how is it, how do you, I think it's really cool that you've built an operation where you, you work very remotely, which is a reality for a lot of game developers right now. But how, well, how's your personal experience? Because you've been in the industry for a long time when working remotely wasn't as possible. How do you mm. sort of manage these relationships with people and companies with only well, some in-person contact? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you know, we're not in their junk, you know, coding their games and animating their monsters and stuff, right? So, so there's, you know, that proximity is less critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the space we're in right here, gameplay space, uh, there's about 20 studios in here, I think four or five of which are part of the Execution Labs portfolio. Uh, and so, you know, we're lucky enough that if we need to go talk to like Tanya at KitFox, you know, mm-hmm. we can walk over there 20 feet and we can have a conversation. Um, you know, the stuff that we tend to work on now tends to be much more strategic in nature. Uh, and so that, you know, is easily done via Skype or, you know, we have a Slack Slack group and all that kind of stuff. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we tend to see each other at places like GDC uh, or, or PAX or some of the other big shows. Um, and we still get that, that FaceTime. But, um, you know, a while back we were doing a physical... Uh, accelerator, like so, for example, the the guys at Arachnid, the, the developers of Deluvian, you know, they were in Montreal for three months as a condition of receiving the funding. So yeah. they had to come here so we can kind of work a little more hands on at the very beginning. Uh, you know, once they've kind of gone through that boot camp, um, you know, then then that intensity is not really required any longer. Yeah. Um, my next question is kind of based off one. It's it's based off a joke I heard about running a game publisher. Um, uh, the question, the joke was, uh, how do you want to be a? Do you, uh, how do you get to be a millionaire in games? And the answer is, um, be a billionaire and start a game publisher. Um, <laughs> which, which I, I guess, I mean, it's it's good for a laugh. Um, but I guess my what what it makes my question into is. Um, when you're going back on the finance side, and I guess trying to convince people that like this game can make money, um, I know that games like film just just it's hard to it's hard to make a lot like kind of a lot of money back, back especially on games that don't have you know IAP transactions or aren't big sixty dollar games. How do you sort of convince people on the finance side that a game is worth convi- is worth um, right. investing in? Yeah, I mean the the real answer is most aren't. Yeah. Right? And, and part of taking on that identity of an entrepreneur, it's your job then to come up with something that at least has the potential to do so. And um, the classic example I give is uh, a couch co-op, like a, like, a, like a local multiplayer game or a local co-op game. Yeah. Where 
um, you know, a developer will come in, they'll pitch us and say, we got this awesome local co-op game, uh, and, uh, you know, we're like, well, we can invest. And like, but we were at PAX and everyone was cheering and it showed well and, you know, look how fun it is and it, and it we're only, you know, three guys or four people and so we're trying to keep it constrained and, and it's like, yeah, but local co-op games don't sell. Like, mm-hmm. Tower Fall sold and then nothing else. Mm-hmm. Or, or, they'll, or they'll sell, you know, if you get really lucky, 50,000 copies, 100,000 copies, you know, which is great if you're three guys in the basement, but that's not, you know, good enough for a publisher or for an investor, right? We want something mm-hmm. that has a much higher ceiling. Yeah. And so, so we just cannot invest in, in, a, in, a, in that kind of game where the ceiling is, is not high enough. So the reality is the likely outcome of most games is zero, right? You're going to yeah. fail because it's just, you know, wild and hard and, and so on. Um, so, you know, you're against all odds to succeed. If you succeed, what does that success look like? And if you tell me, well, for a couch co-op game, success is maybe 100,000 units, then, like, why are we going to bother? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you came to me and you were Psyonix, for example, and you had Rocket League, and you're like, well, we don't know if this like, might be zero, but if it succeeds because it's multiplayer, because we have the deal with Sony, like, it could be millions. Like, it could be. Mm-hmm. And so... As an investor, now this is an investor perspective, which is slightly different than a publisher's. An investor perspective is, I prefer to get zero in the chance that if we succeed, we get millions, than to bet on something that, eh, maybe we double our money. Mm-hmm. Now, publisher, you know, they don't, like, they don't want to break even, but they're, they could be all right with like, break even, double, you know, quadruple their money. It's like, okay, you know, we took a bet and off we went. But from, from a, a VC or an investor point of view, it's zero or, you know, we're the next Rocket League or the next, you know, big, big thing. Why yeah. Is that? I feel like most, most of us don't think that way when it comes to finances. Why do you feel like uh, the real, like, what you should be doing is making the big bets and not the safe bets? Yeah, so, so... Um, I mean, the real answer lies in the economics of VC math. And, right, VCs are managing a portfolio, right? They get, whatever, $100 million, you know, whatever X dollars to invest. They make little bets or whatever. They make bets in a bunch of projects. Um, I mean, normally across other sectors, right, or tech. And I mean, it's rare you find someone like us investing just in games. But generally, it's, you know, I invest in some web thing and some e-commerce thing and some you know, Internet of Things thing and, you know, whatever. I build my portfolio. And again, the rule is all of it's going to fail. Like the chances are high that it's all going to be zero. And so then you need one of the things in your portfolio, like you're making 20, 30 bets. You need one of them to make 20, 30, 40 X to compensate for all the stuff that's zeroed out. And as an Mm -hmm. investor, you know, investors are smart. They do their homework. But the reality is no one has a crystal ball. And so we really don't know which of the 20 things is going to be the thing that's actually going to succeed. And so you make all these bets, and then the burden is on one of them to actually succeed to sort of pay off the, all the losses. You know, whereas, whereas a publisher, I mean, the publisher can still be in business if every game it does kind of breaks even, doubles its money, quadruples its money, you know, slightly safer bet. Now, now some publishers, I think, are more risk adverse. Some take bigger bets. Some are, you know, more willing to take chances and, you know, bigger risk, bigger reward, all that. Uh, but that, but that, in short, is why the, the sort of the mentality of the VCs is, you know, if you're not coming to me with something that could be the next big thing, like, I'm just not into, like, I just don't care. I, like, I just no interest. Um, from the chat, Sean Gooding won, you, and you might have just asked, answered this, um, is Execution Lab specifically looking for long-term opportunities or investment and exit, typically? So, so we take a, a long-term uh, perspective. I mean, we are an equity investor, which means we invest in the company. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I think Alex said at the beginning of the session that we invested in Diluvian. In fact, that's incorrect. We invested in Arachnid Games, the studio. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, they were working on Diluvian at the time, but the actual investment was in the studio. So yeah. we take equity, we take shares of the company, and we become shareholders like the founders. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that 
puts us on a long-term perspective to help the studio grow and succeed over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, naturally, most companies just take time, you know, one game after another and success grows, etc. Um, you know, unlike a publisher, which is a project financing source, where they're hoping that this very game that they put money in is going to, you know, make back all their money and they're focused short term because they're focused on the launch of this game that they backed and they signed up to be the publisher for. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and so in fact, an investor is not incompatible with a publisher and, and us as an investor, we're always excited when one of our teams is working with a reputable publisher like a Gambitious who, you know, can help to sort of grow the, the, the potential of, of the, the game. Yeah. But yeah, so to answer the question is we take a long-term perspective. Um, you actually gave me something to springboard off of. So that's really interesting then that when a developer is thinking of, of approaching you or, um, or, or a company like uh, Execution Labs, they really should be thinking about, about the stuff you're going to be talking in your GDC talk, which, which sounds a little pluggy, but um, which means they need to be thinking about talent acquisition. They need to be thinking about facilities. They need to be thinking about like having a good uh, production workflow using Trello or or um, Atlassian, like these things, they need to be able to prove to you not just about that the game is cool, but that the structure of the company is sound, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, when we take pitches, the first thing we look at is the people and, yeah. and, the, and the vision and roadmap of the company. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, we need to be excited about a particular project because that project is sort of step one on your roadmap and it has mm-hmm. to make sense and, it, you know, et cetera. But if, if, if you're just sort of a ragtag band of scoundrels saying, here's this cool game, but we're all, you know, we're all going to jail or we're all going to sort of disperse to the winds when this is done, mm-hmm. then, then there's nothing for us to invest in because we invest in the team, in the people, in the long-term potential of the company. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, this does relate back to the talk at GDC. And one of the big mistakes from an entrepreneurship point of view is not understanding what you're pitching, right? Like, like oftentimes developers are like, oh crap, I need money. Like I got bills to pay, I need to hire an artist, I gotta go to GDC and you know, hotels are expensive, whatever, I, I need money. And so they kind of go off in the world looking for money. Uh, and they're sort of pitching the problem of not having money. Like mm-hmm. they, they go to anyone saying, I've got this problem, I don't have money. Do you have money for me? Do you have money for me? And I was like, what? I, like, hey, man, I, like, I don't, I'm not interested in your problems. And so, and again, this sort of comes back to, am I, am I an entrepreneur? Am I thinking like an entrepreneur? And so one of the first decisions you have to make is, if I'm going to go out in the world and ask someone for funding, for money, what opportunity am I presenting to them? And is the opportunity this project that I think is going to make lots of money? Or is this opportunity the company that we're building and the team we've created and the workflow and all the resources, et cetera, because I think that company has a long-term potential for growth that, that that investor could be interested in. Now, generally speaking, if what you're doing is pitching the project as the thing of opportunity, you're usually going to publishers. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're going to these government sources that are focused on project financing or you're going to Kickstarter because you're going to tell that to the crowd. Uh, you know, that I have this amazing project for you to back. Generally, if you're looking at investing or or having the company be the opportunity, then you go talk to investors, which kinds of investors at what stage, you know, it's a whole other discussion there. Um, But but, I mean, that's sort of like the fork you first have to make is, am am I going out in the world looking for money for the company? And that means a whole bunch of things in terms of how I pitch it and what the opportunity is and how the deal is structured and who I go chase for money versus if it's the project, again, which is a whole other set of people you're going to pitch to and how you pitch and when and all that kind of stuff. And so that's one of the biggest mistakes is people are just, oh, I need money. I'm going to go out in the world and go get it yeah. without having thought ahead of time, like, oh, wait, hold on a second. What am I actually pitching? Who am I pitching it to? What are their economics? You know why are they going to invest in my company or my project? Uh, so that that's that initial fork r- rarely is done. Right on. 
Um, Alex, do you have anything, or should I go to this question from the chat? Well, I tell you what, I am deep under sea right now, trying to find my way out of this minefield, so why don't you just check in on the chat and see if they have any questions. Right on. Good luck in that minefield, <laughs> Alex. Um, uh, Toku Gaming's back with a question oh. that I actually don't fully understand, but I'm going to ask it, because we're, you know, let's, let's roll the dice. Right. Um, the, he, they describe this as a theoretical question. There are game developers, um, game publishers, um, game vendors, um, uh, he would, he calls this YouTube and Twitch as game exhibition, I'd say that's like influencers, and I guess we also have, he doesn't say this, they don't say this, but, um, we have the game press. Um, I guess uh, what what Toka Gaming is asking is what organization do you see any kinds of new organizations growing in the gaming industry the way, for instance, that YouTube and Twitch has entered the industry in the last couple of years? Whoa. I know, right? Really big picture, right? Like I don't know how to predict that. No pressure. Oh man, maybe he's trying to think of where the, his next great clients are going to come from. Yeah, um, like maybe he's think they're thinking of forming like a le the ultimate legal council of games or something. Yeah, I mean that's you know it's it's hard to predict these things. Um, I mean the two areas that I think there's the most kind of you know shifting and changes going on are on the esports side. Um, you know, with all the sort of investing in the teams and uh, the the different leagues, you know, banding together or disbanding and the different sort of you know rules, organizations, and so on. So I think there's a whole bunch and of the stuff. scandals and all yeah, the scandals. Scandal. Yeah, all all of that stuff. So I think I think yeah. you know, and maybe that's a good place for a lawyer to to get busy. But um, so I, th I think I think there's going to be some jostling on, on that front, or you know, as things evolve and and, and mm -hmm. mature. You know what does that mean in terms of new entities or uh, like I, I don't know it's it's hard to say, um, and then the other one is on the streaming kind of influencer uh, marketing uh, you know the Twitches and YouTubes and Facebook Lives all that kind of stuff and what we're seeing um, you know like one of our teams works with uh, with PewDiePie uh, and we saw last year the whole shift to Revel mode and that sort of label encompassing PewDiePie and a few of his. Uh, buddies, and you know, what does that then mean in terms of how you engage with those key influencers um, and other sort of l similar groupings and and so on to leverage the fact that channels like Twitch and YouTube or you know in China, uh, you know the, the, the suitable or appropriate platforms over there. Uh, I, I think we'll see also some sort of jostling uh, and, and different types of entities to encapsulate the value that's being uh, created there. What does that look like? hard to say um, and I think on you know in the more traditional way although this is not particularly insightful uh, on the publishing side I mean we are seeing this kind of evolution of more what you might call a label uh, you know like sort of the, the devolver model or you mm -hmm. know team team 17 now really being aggressive uh, and sort of coming across more so as a indie label as opposed to an indie publisher uh, instead of you know shifting a little bit what the relationship is between publisher and and uh, developer, um, but I, I suppose that's not really a new kind of thing, and we we've sort of seen that evolving over the past few few years. It yeah, is, it is interesting though. Like, how do you think the value proposition of publishers has changed for developers in the last like ten years? Because it feels like we don't see a lot of what I grew up understanding as traditional publishing deals, but we do see like a lot of um, publishers defining themselves as brands, you know, like Devolver has a style and an aesthetic and people they yep. cultivate as does uh, Tiny Build or anybody else. Yeah, you know, I suppose that's a, that's sort of a, a good good way to look at it, and it's probably where we see parallels to you know um, music and and other other forms of, of entertainment. I, I mean, fundamentally, you know, games need to get in front of gamers, right? You need to get attention. You need to, you know, somehow convince people that what you just created and spent, you know, all your energy and sweat, blood, blood and tears creating is, is worth their time and money. Um, and so ultimately, you know, publishers play that role or, or they share that role. I mean, certainly, um, even as a developer, even if you have a publisher, you still have an important role to play in terms of, you know, live streaming your development and going to different shows and, you know, have, having a presence. So you can't just totally kind of divest all of that to a publisher. Um, but it's a division of labor, right? I mean, publishers tend to have those kinds of people that understand marketing and PR and, and you know, doing events and reaching out to influencers and all that kind of stuff. And so, 
you know, from my perspective, it's really about who's doing the work. And, and certainly a development studio can do all the work if they have the right people and the resources and they allocate the time and attention to do it. The reality is they usually don't. And so then they go to Devolver or Gambitious or Team 17 or whoever and say, please, you know, we need you because we can't do all of that. We don't have the money for it, but also we just don't have the expertise and experience to do it. Here's our awesome game. Please, you know, let's work together. And and so I think that's sort of the this kind of label or brand oriented shift that, that we've been seeing, you know, the past couple of years. Yeah, it feels like uh, almost in response to as it gets easier and easier to make a game and put a game out in front of people, and it becomes harder and harder to cut through all that noise, that like a publisher's value is no longer so much in like printing physical discs and getting them onto shelves. Yeah. On the TV ads, it's just like yeah. finding the audience and getting it in front of a specific audience that they have already attracted. Yeah, and, and, and having, well, either because you have that following, like a devolver has a following, yeah. or because you know how to do it because you did it before and you went to school in that, like, you just know that, like, like you know, Bryant knows how to code and, and you know how to write a press, re- you know, press release and go to a show and talk to marketing people. Like, he, like, he doesn't have those skills because he just doesn't and you have them. Um, and so, yeah, well, whatever. Or whatever skills <laughs> Bryant has, I don't no. know. I, didn't, um, no, I can't even code, so that's why. Yeah, well, so Bryant's completely useless to us. Alex, it's just me and you. Oh. But we, <laughs> but we, you know, we still, we still need the people to do that. And so the biggest mistake, is another mistake that developers make, is they assume that that effort is trivial. Um, and even if they have some money in the bank, if they don't have that knowledge or expertise, they're really just hacking it. And so, you know, the way we look at it is, you know, there's this, you know, we, there's this goal. We have to succeed. We have this game. It has to be awesome. And we have to get out there and market and get people to know it and buy it and love it and all that good stuff. You know, who are the people that are going to get that done? And then you just sort of divvy up the labor. In some cases, it's you have those experts on your team because you that's been intentional if you built it that way. In other cases, you don't have those people on your team. And where are those people? Well, they're sitting at Devolver and Team 17, and so you go talk to them. And if they think you know what you're doing is worthwhile, then you've got a deal on your hands. And if they think it's junk, well, then you know you're, you're sort of at a loss. But yeah, but yeah, I think Alex, your I mean, this is whole the whole indie apocalypse thing, right? Is I mean, the way I say it is, is the barriers to entry have been lower than ever, but the barriers to success also have, or conversely, have been higher than they ever have been. So, I mean, that's powerful for games as an art form. It's powerful for games as a medium of expression that anyone can, like, grab a free copy of Unity or, or whatever and build stuff. And that's powerful and meaningful for, for you know, the industry in a very meta sense. Uh, but from a business point of view, it's you know it's tough. It's really really dire because now everybody's making games. But, but that, I mean, this is just a rehash of the whole indie apocalypse uh, yeah. discussion. There then there's been a million indie apocalypse talks. Yeah, I yeah, should point right. out at GDC. Um, yeah, so yeah. if you want more on that, um, keep an eye out. Uh, before we go on, Jason, if you could do me a big solid, um, you've you've sort of slowly been drifting off screen. If you could oh. shift your chair a bit to the left for me, um, that's all good. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to go to the chat with Kyler WK. Um, and Kyler WK wants to know what indicators about a project make you want to invest or avoid investing in it. Oh boy. Well, well, remember it's he's yeah, asking the, the wrong yeah he's asking the wrong question because yeah. we invest in the in the company. Um, but but of course, I mean the project is part of evaluating the overall uh, suitability of investing in in the company. Um, and so. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, one of the key ones is the team mm-hmm. uh, and the complementarity, that's a word, of the team members. And so we will never invest in a solo developer or a solo entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, really, the minimum, absolute minimum is three. And even there, it's rare that we would do that. But generally, in terms of the core leadership or the core founders of a team, we want to see someone who's technical. We want to see someone who is more creative slash artistic, so kind of designer, art director type. Um, and then someone who has at least a little bit of business acumen or business knowledge or business experience. And I mean, that person could also be a coder, artist, or whatever, but at least they're the one that sort of put up their hand and say, I will wear the suit 
I will go to GDC and I'll do the pitch and I'll book the meetings with the publishers and has sort of taken on those responsibilities, even though day to day that person may also be coding or building some levels or something like that. So you're, um, you're saying you're looking for someone who will go, I volunteer as tribute. Yeah, exactly. I will go into the, you know, into the, the gauntlet. Gates. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so if we don't see that. I mean, that is an immediate red flag. Mm-hmm. And and that's true also, like, if someone, one of those is missing, uh, but also if you're all the same thing, right? You're three programmers or four programmers, and it's like, yeah, we're starting a company. Like, that's a big red flag, right? Because there's no one artistic or creative. There's no one business-oriented, et cetera. Um, so we're really looking at the team uh, makeup and complementarity of backgrounds and, and skills and so on. Um, the next one is the roadmap. Mm-hmm. Right, and so, uh, and I've mentioned this before. One of our trick questions is: we ask you, what does your third game as a company look like? Right, you're in here pitching us today, and with your game X, and we say, well, what does game you know three X look like? And it, and it was like, oh well, crap, we don't know. We haven't talked about it. We have no clue. We've been focused on on X heads down. We you know we have no idea. What that tells us is you're not thinking about yourself as a real company. You're just thinking about the project, and you haven't looked down the road and saying, listen, are we making the right decisions to line us up so that we can make that third game and have the right resources and workflow and the we use the word scaffolding that kind of gets us to that point. Mm-hmm. And and you know one of the one of the related red flags is if if what you're doing is too random, it's a concern, right? If it's like, well, we did this like a VR chess game, and now we're doing a mobile racing game, and the next thing we want to do is an Xbox shooter. I mean, there's no kind of continuity between one game, the tools you're using, uh, the expertise you're creating, the knowledge around, you know, VR versus mobile versus console, like all, all that sort of tacit learning that you get from working on games, you're essentially flushing all that and then starting something from scratch. Mm-hmm. And so if you're trying to build momentum for your company, you do have to think about the roadmap so that game one kind of flows into game two, flows into game three, and I don't mean from a sort of story point of view that necessarily one is a sequel to the other and we have the same character. I mean in terms of technology, workflow, talent, knowledge, expertise. Um, and, and actually, you know, Tanya at uh, Kitfox is a great example of that in that when they started, when they started the studio, um, you know, they, they sort of set some pillars for the kinds of games they want to make and for the type of studio they want to be. And then, you know, what they did on Shattered Planet was a precursor not in terms of thematic, right? Because you know, Shattered Planet is sci-fi, roguelike, and you know, in space, and and Moon Hunters is you know, Mesopotamian themed, and it's a co-op, and it's a, like you look at those things. There's no continuity here, but behind the scenes, in terms of how they address stories and what they do in terms of procedural generation and a lot of the tools and tech they built, it meant that they were able to go much faster, and they had a head start when they went into Moon Hunters. Uh, and then you know we you know they have stuff going on in the oh geez, Tanya was just talking I about heard my <laughs> <piece>. <laughs> hello. Welcome back. It's a, what are I, you saying? Here? All, only good things. Only good things. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Good things. All right. See it. We'll see. Her. <laughs> all right. I, I saw like a shadow moving in. And it was, <laughs> and anyway, so so that that's sort of an example where um, if you can't tell us. What you're thinking for your third game, it's generally a red flag that you're too focused on the game right now that you're working on and not really thinking about yourself as a, as a long-term studio and the kinds of games and vision you have as a studio. So, so this notion of a, of, a, of a studio roadmap or a studio vision um, you know, as, a, as an investor in the company is, is a very important thing and, and often is where a lot of studios kind of just, oh, we didn't even think of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I hadn't thought of that either. Um, luckily, I haven't tried to run a game company, <laughs> but I but I, I I understand where you're coming from. That that it, it's much easier to appeal to uh, a group of people like yourselves when you can when you can make that kind of projection. Even it, and it's kind of interesting that in just I don't think it's something that developers have to explain to players a lot. So it's probably why I haven't heard it before. Even with doing all the interviews I've done. Yeah, um, but I, I mean, again, if you're building a studio, yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, you said workflow before, like, what's our workflow? What's our tool chain? You know, what, what, uh, you know, techniques are we going to use? And, and it's like, 
you know, let, for example, with KitFox, everything you do is procedural. So if they're hiring a programmer, they're going to hire someone that either gets that or has worked on that at some other studio. Mm-hmm. Right? They're not going to hire a programmer that has, I don't know, voxel experience. Like, it's not relevant. So so it, it's not the, sur- the sort of surface thing to make me happy. It's really about building a more successful studio. And it, and it goes down to things like the tools you use, the people you hire. And now if on game one I hired the procedural guy, but then on game two I'm dumping that and I'm doing voxel stuff, what, like – I gotta fire the that guy and go get the box like you know, so so it, yeah. it matters that you've actually thought about the vision and the roadmap of the studio. Now, of course you adjust, you course correct, you tweak, um, but you know, you're not making VR chess and then the next day you're doing mobile racing and then the next day you're doing, you know, shooter on Xbox. Like it just you're just flushing everything you're learning uh, yeah. at that point. I have I have two more questions I hope we have time for, um, but I'm going to start with the first one, which is um, last year we saw Fig finally sort of sort of co- coalesce into, into, yes, we can actually do this, which means now there are going to be game companies out there and game developers who are both trying to go for traditional crowdfunding for their companies, and they're going to try and do this kind of pub investing thing. Um, what's your, do you have any advice for game developers who might be thinking about taking the path on a platform like Fig, where they're, they're bringing in all these investors about their games? Does that differ? Then Obviously, it differs than just going for the traditional crowdfunding model, but is there anything specific you think is worth calling out about that? Yeah, I mean... Um you know, fun, fundamentally, it's a it's a different proposition, uh, of course. Um, I mean, the, the main difference is that, you know, if you go to something like FIG and you succeed, you know, now you're going to have a whole bunch of investors that own shares in your company. Yeah. Uh, and they get votes and they have expectations and they get information. I mean, I, admittedly, I don't know all the nitty gritty terms of, of FIGs. I don't know yeah. precisely what the you know, if they get votes and information rights and whatnot. But, you know, it's not, you, you don't just owe them an art book and a t-shirt and, and, and the game and you're good, right? I mean, they have, they have additional expectations and then you as a, as a business owner uh, have now a whole bunch of other people that own your company alongside you. Uh, and it's a much different proposition than, you know, taking a million dollars from a VC and then you have that representative sitting on your board and you have a relationship with, "Quote unquote," your investor uh, is much different than I've got. You know, thirteen thousand investors all holding a tiny little slice of my my company and and all the expectations or responsibilities uh, thereof. Mm-hmm. Um, again, admittedly, I'm not as sort of well versed in the whole Jobs Act and all that kind of stuff, so I don't really have any you know super insightful stuff to say there. But uh, I, I would say it's non-trivial, and before you do it. You should, you know, do your homework, talk to a lawyer, uh, and really dig into what that means to have these, call it micro investors, you know, owning a piece of your your company. Cool. Um, my second last question. Then I just want to quickly remind the chat. If we we'll be wrapping up in a few minutes, so if you have a, a question for Jason that you really want to get in, feel free to share it now, and we'll try to get it in because I think we'll have time. Um, so, so we talked, uh, we just talked about fig stuff and we've talked a while about kind of traditional game stuff and you've mentioned virtual reality companies a couple times. Now, um, uh, given that there aren't enough headsets in the wild, um, to fully like, like to allow a VR company to sort of just make back money on, on a game right away, how do you, how do you sort of feel, um, how do you sort of approach thinking about VR companies when you're looking at them and deciding if it's worth investing in that company, given that right now they're going to be primarily re- relying on their initial funding, um, both to get their games out the door and then kind of to keep the next few games going, just because just because there's not going to be like a smash VR hit right, right away. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, of course we have seen a couple of things like, uh, was it the raw data, the Servios guys yeah. made a million bucks. I mean, so that's obviously a, a nice indicator. Uh, the reality is we have not invested in any VR specific companies for that very reason. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, when we get pitched by VR folks, I, I generally say, listen, you know, I'll, I'll I'll sit down and chat with you, but hey, you know we're not really looking at VR at this at this point. And so the majority of the investment in VR, uh, from a game point of view, uh, has mainly been from the platforms, right? Because obviously, there it's in their best interest. They're trying to fight the chicken and egg problem and get good content, you know, yeah. under their on their platform to encourage the adoption of more headsets 
and so on. And so the majority then has come from Oculus and via HTC and Samsung, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of the VC money has gone into more so hardware, technology, uh, tool chain, you, you know, all of the other stuff yeah. around VR that's not the games themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of appetite from publishers. Um, I mean, a lot of them actually from, from Asia uh, who, who are more sort of doing normal publishery deals uh, around uh, VR games. But yeah, it's not that much. Again, it's the platforms that are putting stuff in to kind of seed their uh, you know, see their 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 audience, um, and then and then the VC stuff is going into the more hardware and tools and all that stuff. Yeah, so you're so you're sort of saying um, if you're working on a VR game, try to talk to the the either publishers Platform. or platforms. At, uh, at this point, at this point, I, mean, I think yeah. you know we we have seen a few deals like I think uh, Drifter as a recent one had uh, you know Signia and a few other VCs in it. Yeah. I mean that that team was a, a you know. A rock star team of you know ex id and Xbox people. I mean, this is you know real, real top, top notch, top level people, um, and so there could be other strategic reasons that a VC would like place a bet. But when they do that, they'll normally only do one, where they'll say, "Listen, everyone's going crazy on VR. We don't have anything in our portfolio. Uh, you know, let let's find something kick ass and place one bet just to say we've got our toe in the water." Yeah. And, and, and then they won't place any other bets until they see what happens with that. It allows them to kind of stay plugged in and to follow the investment along and, you know, to have something there and not kind of be too late to the party if all of a sudden things, you know, blow up and, and then they got nothing. Um, so, so we've seen a few deals like that, but I, I would say these are more these kind of strategic, like, put one toe in the water as opposed to now all this flood of money is going to come to the game developers. Right. Um, but if you but if you're the kind of developer working on a on a tool on like you said a tool set um, or something something uh, that the company owns the proprietary tech for that's where VCs might perk their ears up. Yeah, yeah, you have a better chance there. Yeah, well, cool. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions from the chat. Uh, Sean Gooding asked kind of a follow up about uh, your uh, like finding further use for game assets would be an example of uh, success. Like like after launch was kind of. He was trying to tie that to what you were saying earlier about processes. So before we go, uh, oh wait, a question just landed. Um, oh. What sort of business structure do you expect to see from a team you're investing in? If the team is coming for you with for help with the business slash marketing side, are you still expecting them to have set up a legal business a legal business entity, um, etc.? Yeah. That question comes from Sol Solato Salado. Well, so, so, I mean, Salado's not listening. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. I mean, or they just tuned it. Maybe, maybe. I mean, so so we're investing in the company, so a company has to exist, right? And be, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. I didn't mean to insult him. Perhaps uh, he or she wasn't there when we were talking about this earlier. Uh, but yeah, that's an automatic no, is if it's just, we're just a bunch of people and we're working on this thing and we shook hands and it's like, like there's nothing for me to put my money into. Yeah. Um, so, so we do require an actual corporation uh, where the individuals have contracts, uh, you know, even if they're paying themselves zero or next to nothing, they still have to have a contract and assign their intellectual property. All this, you know, it has to be clean because we're investing in that corporation and taking shares in it. Um, yeah, so so you need you need to have a and, and publishers are the same, right? I mean, publishers, right. you know, they want they're going to write their check to a company. They'll have more flexibility. You can be a, a you know, whatever an LLC or a C corp. I mean, they they have they're less picky, but. Uh, we definitely want to see a proper corporation set up. Right on. Um, well, we're about to wrap up. So uh, without, again, this, the whole goal is to avoid spoiling your GDC talk. Um, <laughs> can you, well, actually, can you sort of just give one last pitch for the audience about your GDC talk? And uh, wh why, I, I'm sorry we don't have a date or time for you yet, but we sort of tell them why they should show up at uh, GDC next month. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think the simple answer is that the stuff I'll cover are like real life examples of the teams we work with, uh, and this is just stuff that not a lot of developers talk about, and yeah. they just don't they just don't see the real world examples, right? They hear, oh yeah, business is something I need to worry about probably, and and then you know they sort of trial by fire and they screw up and and disaster ensues, and so again, the idea is to share some of those learnings and some of the first-hand knowledge we have of working with all of the studios that we've invested in uh, to help everyone else, you know, avoid those same uh, mistakes. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Jason, awesome. for coming on. Um, uh, let me run through the stuff we need to cover at the end of the show real quick. Um, brief disclosure that Gamma Sutra and GDC are um, sibling uh, organizations under UBM America. Um, just because we're promoting, we're talking about GDC talks here, we have to say that sort of thing. Um, if you could do us, uh, for those tuning in, if you enjoyed our chat with Jason today, if you could do me a favor and click the subscribe button down below, um, that'll help us out a lot uh, so that we can keep giving you more of these conversations with people uh, and you know business folks like Jason, game developers, programmers, artists. We're going to be talking to a lot of them as we get ready for GDC. Um, and that's about it. Uh, thank you all for showing it for tuning up. Um, I'm Brian Francis, contributing editor to Gama Sutra. Uh, and I have been Alex Waro, uh, another editor at Gama Sutra. Jason, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you guys. Right, we'll you awesome. See you, man. see you. Bye. 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 Turn us off this time. I never have to do this. Here we go. Bye.